Mr. Moruba, it is still hard to understand at a real scale the colossal dimensions of cruelty and destruction that Second World War has produced in all as aspects of the existence of humanity. What kind of a world did we inherit after 1945, the year zero? Well, in many ways, a very different world from our own, because what I was trying to describe in that book was um, how terrible the consequences are of war. And people often imagine uh, that war ends and you, uh, you win a war and then or lose, and then everything, then life goes on. But of course, life goes on. But the the consequences, of course, are catastrophic. We see it in, in Iraq just as much as we saw it in. Uh, the world in 1945. That vast numbers of people are displaced, they lose their homes, uh, they don't have enough to eat, uh, you have revenge, civil wars, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it was a period of hope, at least in the western uh, side of the world. I mean, in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, it was a somewhat different situation, probably. But in the west, Western Europe and the United States, there was a sense of hope because there was this idea of building a, a better world, a more just world, a uh, more equal world in, with international institutions in which another war like the last one would never be possible. So the social demo democracy that we saw uh, that emerged from 1945 in Western Europe and even in, in the United States um, was a direct result uh, of the catastrophe of World War II. And I think uh, that one of the dangers of our own time is that we now are in danger of forgetting that. I mean, for example, the European Union. The European Union was established precisely to make sure that Germany and France in the first place, that European countries would not, not go to war again. Now, young people now don't see the danger of that anymore, and don't, so it's not a convincing reason for them to be loyal to the, the European Union. And, and there are other things, uh, similar things too. So I think on the one hand it was a period of catastrophe, on the other hand it was a period of creation coming out of destruction. And um, we are now forgetting uh, the destruction. You say like this in 1945, and I quote, the German and the Japanese war criminals and their accomplices were not brought to justice only with the purpose of re-establishing the rule of law, but to reinstate civilization. Sometimes there are so many guilty people, tens and hundreds of thousands of them, that there are no physical and technical possibilities for the societies to properly judge them. Then symbolic judgment comes on the stage. Some people are brought to justice for the sake of re-establishing or reinstating civilization, the real civilization, end of quotation. My question is, is symbolic, therefore selective justice, a real value of civilization? Um, yes, because absolute justice is, is impossible, you cannot. Um, after a, a dictatorship or after a war, put everybody on trial who was somehow uh, culpable or complicit, it would be totally impossible. So all you can hope for, that there is a kind of a, a symbolic justice, and that means that you have to select and you uh, put some of the leaders on trial uh, and so forth. Um, so it, it's for de mieux, really. You, 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 there is no other way of, of dealing with it, I don't think. I think th there were various uh, schools of thought uh, in 1945. Winston Churchill was in favor of simply like picking the leaders and, and putting them from the wall and shooting them and dispense with trials. Uh, the Russians, the Soviets, interestingly, were in favor of trials because they like trials, show trials. And to them, uh, Nuremberg was a kind of show trial. The Americans were also in favor of the trial to, uh, as a kind of symbol of establishing the rule of law and also establishing laws that would apply uh, in future. So yes, it is in part a symbolic exercise, but probably a necessary one.
what will you answer if somebody, not in the best mode possible, would say, I'm fed up of seeing the same people ruling the old system and the new system as well? How will you answer to that? I would answer that I would be fed up too. Um, but that's why you need democratic institutions so that people have the chance to vote them out. And if they don't vote them out, well, then uh, they deserve what they get. But um, the only way to deal with that is a democratic way, not um, by uh, revenge or anything of that sort. Ceea ce spune cuiva care ar spune, poate nu în cea mai bună stare posibilă, m-am săturat să văd aceiași oameni în același sistem de guvernare, fie el vechi sau nou. Ea spune și eu, de aceea cred că este nevoie de instituțiile democratice ca să poți să-ți exerciți dreptul la vot și dacă acești oameni care spun că s-au săturat nu votează altfel, atunci probabil că merită ceea ce votează. Dar cred că soluția este în acest proces democratic al votului, în niciun caz în răzbunare sau în altă manifestare. Here's another long quotation, but relevant, I hope. You say, so have things been done rightfully? Were there enough purges and trials in order to convince the population that justice had been done? Inevitably, the answer is no. Too many murderers remain free, and some of them would even develop brilliant careers, while others far less guilty, were punished as scapegoats. But total justice, even under the most favorable circumstances, is a new utopian idea, you said that. Justice would have been impossible because of practical and political reasons as well. You cannot bring to justice millions of people. The act of punishment of the ones who are guilty has to be placed also in the context of other interests. End of quotation. My question is, Can you specifically name some of these other interests? Um, okay. This is more or less the same question that, that yes. we already dealt with. Um, let me answer it in this way. I think most people in, in dictatorships um, are not true believers. I think most people are opportunists. Look, there are, of course, true believers, and there are truly uh, uh, bad people, but I think most people are opportunists. And um, this is not a very pleasant reflection on humanity, but I do believe that's the case. Now, there's one positive aspect of human opportunism, which is that human beings can serve a bad system or a good system with the same enthusiasm. And so a lot of people who uh, served uh, in, in Hitler Germany as bankers and bureaucrats and diplomats and so on, um, there were two ways of dealing with that. You could try and put them all in prison, uh, in which case uh, you risk um, undermining uh, German democracy, you, could, you risk uh, creating a class of people who would only want to Uh, have vengeance, of revanchism, or, uh, which is the uh, choice that Adenauer, Konrad Adenauer, uh, took, which is to try and integrate them into the new German, uh, West German democracy. So that meant that a lot of professors and bankers and diplomats and so on came back uh, who had been guilty of collaborating uh, in the Nazi regime. But they came back as Democrats. And that is unpleasant, but I do think it probably served the purpose of democracy. But the same thing happened in France, when de Gaulle, uh, after the war, quite deliberately chose to ignore the fact that half of France collaborated with the Germans. And he created this myth that everybody had been a resistor. And he did this in order to uh, make sure that there wouldn't be a kind of uh, underground civil war in France after the war, which would have undermined uh, the democracy. Now, this is not pleasant. It's, it's, uh, it's very unpleasant for the, the young generation growing up in those circumstances, but it was probably a, a, a necessary form of unpleasantness. 